Hello, and welcome to the ninth episode of our Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe read-through. I'm Jem, the reader at St John the Baptist Parish Church in Beeston, and the chapter we're looking at today is In the Witch's House. So if you haven't read it already, do so by all means. Uh, it begins, and now of course you want to know what had happened to Edmund, don't we all? And it runs to make ready our sledge, ordered the witch, and use the harness without bells. Now the beginning of this chapter involves a slight fictional switch, perhaps we might even say a slight fictional trick from Lewis, because the previous chapter has been narrated apparently from a, a generally neutral point of view, but certainly focused from the point of view of the Pevensey children. And we've had that in the book so far, that when they see something or find something out, we also find it out. And there are moments where Lucy or the group as a whole or Edmund have been the, the focalising character. And all four of them were with the beavers and they were being fed and being told these things. And then at the end of that chapter, suddenly the three children and the two beavers realise that one of the characters that they had taken for granted was in the scene, Edmund, is in fact not there. Then the same thing happens to us. We obviously aren't told at this point Edmund left. So the beginning of the next chapter has to go back slightly in time and retell that time, if not that same narrative, because obviously Edmund's busy doing something else, from Edmund's point of view. So we actually backtrack in time. Um, and the, the effect, I think, of that is to give us the same shock that the characters get, where we've taken it for granted that the characters that we were told went into this room and were doing all these things were doing all these things, and then suddenly we realise that one of them is missing, just as the other characters saw. And indeed, we realise that we've been seeing this scene from the point of view of Peter, Susan and Lucy, but not actually Edmund. So it says, and now, of course, you want to know what had happened to Edmund, etc., etc. He had enjoyed the dinner, but had been yearning for Turkish delight, that good meal, bad meal thing that I've been tracing uh, so far. Uh, he was a bit worried by the, the sound of Aslan's name rather than overjoyed and cheered by it. Again, that sense that the name of Aslan, like the name of Jesus in the Bible, does things. It has power. It calls out responses from people. Um, it creates uh, effects around it. And we're told when he left, just as Mr Beaver had been repeating the rhyme about Adam's flesh and Adam's bone, Edmund had been very quietly turning the door handle. And just before Mr Beaver had begun telling them that the white witch wasn't really human at all, but half a gin and half a giantess, Edmund had got outside into the snow and cautiously closed the door behind him. Now let's go back to that rhyme that he mentions. When Adam's flesh and Adam's bone sits at Care Palavel and throne, the evil time will be over and done. The last episode I suggested that, that reminded me rather of anonymous Middle English lyrics, like uh, I sing a, a maiden that is Macaless, or specifically Adam Lay Abounden. And indeed on looking them up I found that Adam Lay Abounden does contain specifically wintry imagery and the idea that Adam is, is bound during 4,000 winters. Here I think it comes in, into even sharper focus. And again, this is something that I hadn't noticed until this read-through, so I was, I was really cheered to pick up on it. The very moment that Edmund is turning the, the door handle and escaping and essentially splitting himself off from the family and, we might say, betraying them, or certainly preparing to betray them, is the moment that, that those lines about Adam's flesh and Adam's bone are being chanted by the beaver. <clears throat> And it associates this action with the, the drama of that lyric and the drama that that lyric uh, speaks about, which is the fall, original sin, the, the situation from which Christ liberates humanity. Indeed, I think it's, it also makes an association between Edmund and Adam that has been dormant or not even there up to this point. I hadn't noticed it particularly. I've been thinking of Edmund largely in terms of Judas, uh, he's the betraying character, the character who turns people over to the enemy. Uh, and I think that's definitely there. But one of the interesting things about the way Lewis handles biblical material in this book is that he layers characters onto each other. Uh, he splices scenes together. He takes out some images and stresses other images together. We'll see this particularly when we come to uh, the death of it and resurrection of Aslan, where the girls, uh, Susan and Lucy, represent several groups of people in the Gospels and several events are layered onto each other or synthesised together to stress the, the common themes or the common images of them. Um, but yes, yeah, so I, I think there's, a, there's a, a real sense in which we're offered 
Edmund's identity as as Adam here. And Adam, of course, is is significant for the coming of Aslan, the coming of the Christ figure, because of the amount of uh, theology and the amount of literature and, and preaching throughout Christianity that has associated them as the figure that that fell to sin, so to speak, and then the figure that restores humanity from sin. It's all it's all there in the Bible, of course. Um, this passage reminded me particularly of 1 Corinthians 15. So 1 Corinthians uh, 15, 22, I beg your pardon, uh, 21 <laughs> reads, For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. And then later on, it says, So it is written, the first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last Adam was made a quickening spirit. Howbeit, that was not first which is spiritual, but that which is natural, and afterward that which is spiritual. The first man is of the earth, earthy. The second man is the Lord from heaven. As is the earthy, such are they also that are earthy. As is the heavenly, such are they also that is heavenly. And as we have borne the image of the earthy, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. Now I say this, brethren, that flesh and blood, flesh and bone, we might say, from uh, from the, the uh, beaver's rhyme, but I say this, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, neither does corruption inherit incorruption. Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. And then he goes on to that, that great um, further passage about the, uh, the resurrection and uh, the, the last coming and the, the last trump. But that cluster of images uh, that is embedded in Corinthians there about the first man and the last man and the earthy and the heavenly and flesh and bone, flesh and blood, I beg your pardon, not being able to uh, inherit uh, the spiritual kingdom are, I think, embedded very quietly, but also very densely in a very Lucian way in this passage where it's the moment when people are talking about Adam's flesh and Adam's bone that Edmund is turning the door handle and sneaking out. He's, he's, he's fulfilling, if you like, uh, the fall. He's fulfilling this betrayal that he's been leading up to, that we've been tracing psychologically through him, and making necessary the coming of Aslan or fulfilling the conditions for the coming of Aslan, which has been mentioned already in this scene, but which we're going to see later on the novel. So, yeah, I was really struck by the, the cluster of images there. Uh, Edmund as Adam as the first man, Edmund and Aslan balancing in the same way that Adam and Christ do, and specifically that it's, it's at this moment which has been uh, a hopeful moment because the verse is about um, fulfilment, but here it points to fall and sinfulness. So I was absolutely fascinated by that. Um, I was also intrigued as Edmund goes on to this chapter and we hear more in, more inside his head, so to speak. We, we really focus on Edmund's thoughts because not a lot of action happens. So he's mostly trundling through the snow, arguing with himself till he gets to the, the Queen's house. And I was really intrigued by both the, the developing of psychology here. As I've said before, I think Edmund is one of the most psychologically complex characters in the, um, in the, the novel. So interesting, again, that he's associated with Adam, humanity, but, but fallen humanity and humanity that has the potential to be redeemed. Um, and the precise form in which he, uh, he, he argues with himself and thinks for himself, there's a, a doubleness I've already mentioned that Edmund seems to have more of, an, more of a warring internal monologue uh, than other people. Again, perhaps that reminds us of bits of Paul where he talks about willing the good but doing the bad uh, and having the having having thorns in your flesh that are that are tugging away at you, um, there's a a level of as I say depth in psychology which seems to be reflected in in Paul's writing. Edmund seems to be a rather Pauline character at various points, um, and he says here. In fact, I think I really think he might have given up the whole plan and gone back and owned up and made friends with the others if he hadn't happened to say to himself, "When I'm king of Narnia, of course, the first thing I shall do will be to make some decent roads." And that set him thinking off about being a king and all the other things he would do. And this cheered him up a good deal. He had just settled in his mind what sort of palace he would have and how many cars and all about his private cinema and where the principal railways would run and what laws he would make against beavers and dams and was putting the finishing touches to some schemes for putting Peter in his place when the weather changed. Now, we've seen before Edmund's taste for power. In a small 
way when he recognises the, the weakness in Lucy's position where she's defending something that seems totally indefensible and, and apparently telling silly stories, and he leaps on that and mocks her and, and taunts her for it. But we've also seen that in that that's how the witch gets to him. She initially offers him the, the Turkish light and, and tells him about how he can be a prince. And, of course, given his identity with Adam that we're focusing on in this, in this chapter, Edmund could say, just as Adam said, that the woman tempted me and I did eat. Um, he he gives up, when I say he gives up his heritage for a mess of pottage, in a rather, rather easel light way, but he gives up his family and he gives up his uh, true identity for the sake of this thing she offers him to eat. And after all, that line itself is a form of betrayal. It's a form of, of trying to pass the blame from Adam to Eve. And um, so it's, he's, he's bound up in this Adamic imagery. But the... The interest in power that she ha he has is how the witch gets to him and how he sustains himself in in continuing this betrayal and, and continuing to, to turn his, his siblings over to her. And the form of kingship he imagines in, is interesting. I've previously said how Peter seems to imagine a rather heraldic form of kingship, almost instinctively, where he thinks of stags and hawks and noble things and, and leadership of his people. Here, Edmund initially thinks about uh, having a palace. Again, that's a noble, medieval, traditional way of thinking about things and how many cars and all about his private cinema, and where the principal railways would run, what laws he would make against beavers and dams, and then putting some finishing touches, lovely phrase, putting some finishing touches to some schemes for keeping Peter in his place. That strikes me as a very interesting progression, that he starts in this noble imagery of rulership, of kingship, being at a palace, and then having cars, you know, he, he wants material possessions, and then his private cinema, which is, again, a, a, perhaps a rather childish luxury. I, I want this, I want this uh, cinema only for myself, and I'll be the only one who sits there, which, rather than having a private theatre, is sort of defeating the point of a cinema, and that it's supposed to be a place where people gather to watch films. But again, his pleasures are insistently solitary and insistently exclusive, rather than the inclusive uh, table fellowship and table joy that we've seen elsewhere uh, with the, the Pevensies and the Beavers and Mr Tumnus. And then he starts thinking about where he'll put railways and what laws he'll make. And by this time, he's really morally transgressed. I think by Lewis's code, he's become uh, essentially fascist. Um, he's, you know, what they said about Mussolini, he made the, the railways run on time. But he's thinking about uh, a modernistic form of rule. I'm not saying that modernism is, is aligned to, to fascism inherently, but that in Lewis's mind, that kind of institutionalization, that kind of totalitarian idealism that we saw hinted at earlier with the bureaucratic language of Malgrim really takes over Edmund's imagination here. He thinks about cars and private cinemas, which of course Hitler had one of those, um, and he thinks about running uh, railways through the land, and he thinks about making laws that will crack down on the kinds of people who have annoyed him personally and make laws about beavers and dams because he's feeling resentful about these people. And then he'll make uh, administrative schemes to get at one particular person. There's a real sense in which he's being attracted by, first of all, the, the trappings of being a, a wealthy little boy, and then he's being attracted by the trappings of being a tyrant, a potentate, and that that warps what he's thinking. And um, we can see his moral degeneration, I think, from triviality into full-blown tyranny within a few clauses, just by the kind of things that he thinks would be nice and that he thinks he can daydream about. So when he comes to the, uh, the White Witch's house, it's a bit more than a house. It says, And the moon was shining brighter than ever. The house was really a small castle. It seemed to be all towers, little towers, with long pointed spires on them, sharp as needles. They looked like huge dunches caps or sorcerer's caps. And they shone in the moonlight, and their long shadows looked strange on the snow. And Edmund began to be afraid of the house. And he goes forward, and he sees uh, these figures uh, in, the, in the courtyard. Then at last he began to wonder why the lion was standing so still, for it hadn't moved one inch since he first set eyes on it. Edmund now ventured a little nearer, still keeping in the shadow of the arch as much as he could. He now saw from the way the lion was standing that it couldn't have been looking at him at all, in fact, it was staring at something else, namely a little dwarf who stood with his back to it about four feet away. And Edmund thinks, oh, I'll get my chance as soon as the lion springs on that dwarf. I'll, I'll take my chance and escape. And of course, he realises they're both made of stone, or they've both been turned to stone, as, as we know has happened. 
The relief which Edmund felt was so great that in spite of the cold, he suddenly got warm all over right down to his toes. And at the same time, there came to his head what seemed a perfectly lovely idea. Probably, he thought, this is the great lion Aslan that they're all talking about. She's caught him already and she's turned him into stone. So that's the end of, the, of all their fine ideas about him. Pooh, who's afraid of Aslan? And he stood there gloating over the stone lion and presently he did something very silly and childish. He took a stump of lead pencil out of his pocket and scribbled a moustache on the lion's upper lip, and then a pair of spectacles on its eyes, and then he said, Yah, silly old Aslan, how'd you like being a stone? You thought yourself mighty fine, didn't you? But in spite of the scribbles on it, the face of the great stone beast still looked so terrible and sad and noble, staring up in the moonlight, that Edmund didn't really get any fun out of jeering at it. He turned away and began to cross the courtyard. Now, there are several things I, I want to say about this, all sorts of things jumping around in this chapter, aren't there? Um... I think there's possibly an echo of Bunyan in here. There are lions that prevent, or uh, that are going to prevent Christian from getting to the House Beautiful uh, at one point in the Pilgrim's Progress. And he is very stalwart and marches forward and they don't eat him after all. I think those lions are probably borrowed from the simile in the Bible where it was the, the lion, sorry, the, the devil by an adversary who uh, roams around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And Christian is very stalwart and managed to get past the lions. And, and Faithful later on in the book says, oh, the, the lions weren't out at that point, so I managed to get to the house beautiful and the porter let me in. I'm possibly only thinking that because I thought there was a, a bunyan tang about the last chapter, but hey, lions, it's good imagery. Either way, I think we've got the, the um, biblical imagery of, of the lion being both their messiah, the lion of Judah, but also to some people it seems terrible. It seems like the, the devil, the lion devouring. More securely, I think... Um, there is a there's a an air of the medieval romance of Sir Orfeo. Again, this is this is slightly speculative, but I'm going for it. Um, when Sir Orfeo has has lost his lost his wife, it's a medieval retelling of the Orpheus myth. When he's lost his wife and she's been carried away to um, the the fairyland, uh, he seeks her and eventually he comes to the house where she's being kept, and he finds that. It's a glorious house and it's it's shining and in a slightly eerie way, sort of shining and bright, doesn't seem to have sunlight and moonlight. And there are these figures that he finds inside it. And my Middle English accent is, is not good, so I do apologise for this. Um, the porter undid the gate anon and let her, him into the castle gone. Then he began behold all about and sealing and we in the wall of folk that were Thideu brought, and thought a dead, and ne'er a knocked. Some stood without an head, and some non armors had, and some through the body had wound, and some lay woe debound, and some armed on horses set, and some are strangled as they ate, and so were somewhere in water a drained, and some with fire all for shrinked, wives that lay on childer bed, some dead and some a wed, and wonder feeler there besides, right as they slept here under tides, each was thus in this wild ye known, with fairy the day come. So he sees all these figures who are apparently dead, but, but actually not, sort of frozen between life and death, and, they, and, and uh, set in these attitudes in which they died and when they were stolen away uh, by the fairies. Now that, I say, seems to, seems to provide some of the emotional uh, and imaginative resonance here of these figures that have been locked in the moment of what they were doing when they were taken by the witch. So that might, of course, explain why they're actually uh, transported to this castle. Perhaps they were people who, who tried to, to uh, storm the castle and were, and were zapped by her, so to speak, because we're told elsewhere that the squirrels and small wooden animals just re remain as, as statues in the wood when they've been turned to stone. But I'm slightly getting sidetracked, so back to Sir Orfeo. <laughs> uh, there is a similar sense, I think, of the eerie there that to be turned to stone um, is, to be, is to be held between life and death in this creepy, eerie house. Um, so there's, there's possibly, as I say, a, a medieval resonance going on there about people who are taken away by the uncanny forces of the fairyland and the kind of half-life and, uh, and locked death that they live in. What there definitely is, is an echo of the scourging and mocking of Jesus. This, this moment when he uh, thinks that Aslan has already been overcome uh, and he mocks him and says, oh, who's afraid of you? I think you, th you think you're so clever and so wonderful, don't you? Well, you know, I can mock you. And then he defa literally defaces him by um, scribbling a, a, 
spectacles and a moustache on him and, and jeering at him. This seemed to me to be a very clear pre-echo, a, a type, if you like, of the uh, the mocking and the humiliation of Aslan um, when he's killed later on. Spoilers! <laughs> uh, Edmund shows in miniature, in microcosm, the attitude which, which will express itself in the, the degradation and humiliation and mocking uh, of Aslan. The As I've said before, the the moral development of Edmund shows in miniature all sorts of things that are going to have huge cosmological consequences. And it's quite a good uh, pinging back and forth, I think, between the absolutely terrible and the really personal and petty and small that Lewis is, is so good at honing in on the way sin is, is sin. It expresses itself in different ways, but uh, it's essentially the same kind of impulse. Um, again, a, a very central point to to Lewis's uh, moral theology, I think. And there's, there is something, there's something nasty and unpleasant about the, the fact that seeing what he seems to be his enemy within his power, he decides to, to mock and jeer and deface in the same way that As Aslan will be defaced by having his, his hair um, cut off, his mane cut off. And we can see that, I think, obviously, in, in a parallel to the crown of thorns and the, the mocking worship that is paid to Jesus um, by the, the soldiers before his crucifixion and the way they hit him and ask him if he can prophesy if he's so clever who's hit him uh, and they pretend to be uh, to be wowed by him and awed by him. So there are all sorts of uh, biblical echoes really clustering in this chapter. There's other things that, that go on as well, but I was particularly struck by the way the, the passion narrative and all that the passion narrative brings with it, the, the cosmological stretch between Adam and Christ uh, and the, the pre-echo, the type of the, um, the scourging and the mocking of Christ begins to cluster in. We start getting the images that are going to play out much more strongly in the rest of this book. We've had elements of that, and I've argued that there is biblical material earlier on in this book, but I think this is a chapter where the, the plot really goes into overdrive. Edmund... Uh, takes everything uh, uh, in hand, so to speak, and, and drives the plot onwards, and we start getting many more business, biblical resonances and images packing towards uh, the, the characters, and those are going to be really played out in the next chapters. So that's what struck me about these this, the, the elements in this particular chapter. I'd be really interested to hear from you. What, what sprung into your mind when you read it? What seems to you important and interesting about this chapter? Do leave comments below, and the next chapter we'll be looking at is entitled The Spell Begins to Break. It runs from Now We Must Go Back to Mr and Mrs Beaver and the Three Other Children, and it runs to But long before they had finished enjoying themselves, Mr Beaver said, Time to be moving on now. And I really look forward to talking to you about that chapter soon. <laughs>